All right, how's it going, y'all? So today we're gonna to be going over how to exceed the normal 100 meter run that's allowed by your standard Cat5, 6, or 7 RJ45 Ethernet cable. And so to do that, we're actually gonna be using fiber optic cables and some pretty cheap media converters. And so fiber optic cable has a few really big advantages over normal copper cables for some specific applications if you need them. So one, and probably the most commonly used, is you can have incredibly long runs with fiber optic cables. So the real reason why fiber is so great for fiber in the home, so if you've got a fiber internet provider like Google Fiber or something like that, you're actually able to have a direct connection from the master network to your house because it can run over a fiber optic cable. It does not have a limitation where they've got to use coaxial cables, which just ends up being a lot slower and you've got to aggregate everybody together. Instead, for fairly inexpensive hardware, you're able to run multi-kilometer runs with fiber optic cables, and so you don't have to have all those amplification circuits and everything like that. Instead, you just have to run fiber to everybody's homes, and then you can just keep turning up the speed as much as you'd like. And so that's why you're able to get way better internet service out of a fiber optic connection. It's because there's no bottlenecks when it comes to having multiple people in your area all using the same connection. Instead, you have a direct connection and you could turn that up to 10 gig over the normal lines that have been run when that does come out as a standard. Really the only limitation now is how expensive it is to actually send your packets rather than what's going over the cable, which is a great place to be now. And that's mostly what we're gonna be talking about in this video, but fiber optic cable also has two big advantages over regular copper ethernet cables. And the first is the fact that you can go incredibly fast runs with this for overall network speed. So right now the maximum throughput you can get on any RJ45 copper device is 10 gigabit. And that hardware is actually pretty expensive. It's just now coming where it's reasonable for consumers to buy. And so that is a limitation that you just cannot go any faster than that with a copper ethernet cable. Now when it comes to fiber optic, you can go so much faster than that. And it really just depends on how fast you need to go. There is a 400 gigabit standard out there that you can purchase if you have the money for. And so by having these fiber optic runs, you can go really fast speed if you need it. Though for this, we're just gonna be talking about a one gigabit connection. And so then finally, the other thing that a lot of people don't really think about is the fact that fiber is completely non-conducting for electricity. And so that has two real advantages. First off, you can run it through the most electrical noised environment that you can imagine. You can run it by power lines, you can run it by a substation, you could run it through pretty much anything and you're not going to be messing up the electrical connection within here. Maybe if you have enough high voltage with enough high frequencies, you could actually bend the light within it, but that, that's just not gonna happen. So fiber is easily able to be run through anything. And the other one is for lightning protection. So fiber optic cables are completely non-conducting. And so say you've got a lightning strike that either hits a copper cable or a fiber optic cable. That copper ethernet cable is going to conduct that lightning throughout both ends of whatever it's connected to. And so it will just fry everything in between. I've heard horror stories online about people actually having a lightning strike hit an outdoor run of an ethernet cable. And that lightning strike, that surge from the lightning strike goes through and hits the switch and goes to every single device out there that is connected on the network. And the other thing is, most manufacturers are not shielding their actual ethernet ports for lightning strike or anything like that, and so it's just frying motherboards. You could easily get $5,000 of damages if you've got all that set up, and so that's why it's normally not a great idea to have an outdoor run for an ethernet cable. If it's just attached to your house, you should hopefully be fine, but if it's actually like run underground, Anybody who's had an electric fence for their dog has probably experienced at least once that the lightning struck it and fried out the entire thing. When I was a kid, ours got struck by lightning and fried the entire thing and we had to replace it. The exact same thing can happen with outdoor ethernet cables, especially if they're in the yard just general, because lightning loves to find electrical things even if they're buried underground by a few inches. And so what a lot of people will do, and you'll see this for some setups online, is they'll basically create a sacrificial switch. So say you've got a three different devices you need to run outdoor ethernet lines to. What you can do is buy a cheap unmanaged switch and basically have that be the, you know what, if lightning strikes any one of those cables, 
and it happens to go down the thing and all those devices fry, it sucks, but I'm gonna insulate that from the rest of my network. And so what you can do is you can buy just two little media converters and a little run of fiber and connect them together. And so what'll happen is you'll be able to have ethernet run through the fiber optic cable and that way it's completely insulated. So in the case where the lightning strikes the exterior device, hits the switch, everything connected to the switch fries, the actual media converter right here that's connected to the switch will probably fry, but that electricity would not go over the run, meaning the rest of your network that has the really expensive stuff like your TV connected in, your Xbox, your computer, everything would hopefully be safe. If you are doing this, make sure they're connected to two different surge protectors because you don't want it to go through the actual power outlet on here and still go through. But that's another big advantage of fiber. And while you'll see these random runs in people's setups that have like a little two inch run for fiber, you're like what, why, why would you have that? And it's because they're shielding themselves from a electrical storm or anything like that. All right, and so before we go through this entire setup and talk about what you need, I do want to say everything you see in front of me here, fs.com did send to me for free and they sent me a lot of other stuff too but no money change hands or anything like that though i do get to keep the products so in that case they did send me the stuff just full description all right and so now let's go ahead and talk about how you would set up either a really long ethernet run so i'm talking kilometers in length if you needed that or this lightning protection circuit and really you just need three things well duplicates of two of them so the first thing you need and you'll need obviously two of these is a little media converter just like this. So a media converter is exactly what it sounds like. It converts the media from fiber optic to regular ethernet, that electrical signal. And so this is the one in front of me that I've got right here, has an SFP port on it, and then two RJ45 one gigabit ports on there. So it kind of acts as a unmanaged switch as well. And so this one right here is regular one gigabit. They do make 10 gigabit versions of these, and they also do make versions of these that also are PoE. So you can actually get them where they actually provide PoE power to the next device. So say you have a security camera in a cabin or something way out in the middle of nowhere and you need a long run to it, you can get this and then instead of having to go through and also power the thing separately, it's just all PoE, so all in one package. So they make a lot of different versions of those. If you're doing one gigabit, you just need SFP. If you're doing 10 gigabit, you need SFP plus versions. And so then the next thing you need is a fiber optic transceiver like the one I've got right here. So a fiber optic transceiver is pretty simple. It converts the signal out of here, which is an SFP connector. There's also SFP plus, SFP 28, tons of different versions of fiber optic methods but this one converts it to light. And whenever you are purchasing one of these things, you need to pretty much check three different things of it to make sure it's compatible. So one, and this is not the case when you're buying from the same brand like with FS, you need to make sure that the transceiver and the actual device you're plugging into will match. And this is one of the most annoying things about fiber is the fact that all these different manufacturers decided they can make a lot more money if they sell the actual network card or anything like that for fairly cheap and then charge you absurd amounts of money for the actual transceivers. And so you need to make sure that the card you're plugging it into is not going to be locked down and that you can plug in the transceiver you're buying. So fs.com does also sell like mock transceivers that will emulate the firmware of all those other transceivers for ones that are locked down but you just need to make sure you know exactly what the transceiver is that you're plugging it into and what the card is expecting. It's probably one of the most annoying things about fiber and it's just companies being trying to milk every dollar out of giant corporations by charging them sometimes like 10 times to 20 times as much as you can buy them from somebody like FS. And so just make sure whatever card you are going to be plugging into is going to match the type that your transceiver is. It's just annoying. Then after that, you need to make sure that the connectors on the end are the same type of the connectors on your fiber. And so the most common one, and probably what I would recommend if you don't know a ton of what you're doing, is just go for the LC connector. It is ultra standardized. Most fiber, at least that I've seen in the wild, is LC connected on the end. It's very easy to just set up and buy, and most people seem to have it. There's a ton of connectors you can buy for it, and it's just pretty easy. You can also have really long runs with it. So I go with LC for all my stuff, but you can also buy the cables with whatever ends you need on them. 
And so you just need to make sure those two ends match. And finally, the last thing you need to check and make sure is that the mode of the fiber matches the mode of the transceiver. So fiber has two different modes. There's multi-mode and single mode. And so after that, you should just be able to go. I guess technically you do need to make sure that if you're using SFP plus, you've got an SFP plus transceiver, but really that's all there is to it. The next thing you need is the fiber. And so this is pre-terminated fiber, which is what pretty much everybody's gonna be doing. So this is pre-terminated what's called a patch cable. And so as you can see, I purchased it with the two ends already on. And nobody's building their own fiber at home. And next to you no know, businesses, especially smaller businesses, are going to be ending their own fiber for them. It is just an incredibly precise process where you've got to have everything incredibly clean and the equipment to do it and do it right is just outside of anybody's budget. And you have to run miles of fiber before it's worth it to not just buy the pre-terminated stuff. And so you pretty much just buy the ends terminated and then you're kind of good to go. It's just like a really long ethernet cable that you buy pre-terminated. And so when you're dealing with fiber, the one other thing you do kind of need to make sure is that it is not as strong, it is not as durable as regular ethernet cables are. So ethernet cables, you can bend them, you can do whatever, and you're really not gonna break them too easily unless you're pulling a ton on them or anything like that. Fiber, it's not as bad as it was about 10 years ago, but it's still not necessarily super strong. It's not as durable as an ethernet cable, it's just not. So don't try to just pull it through a wall and expect it to be totally fine. Instead, you do wanna be a little bit more gentle with it because there is a essentially bead of silicon glass in here that conducts the light just really, really well. And so if you do break it, it's completely useless now. The other thing is just don't bend it too tight. All fibers will have a specified bend radius, the minimum bend radius that they can survive. And so just make sure to stay away from that radius. If you do need a really tight bend radius for some reason, you can actually buy different types of fiber that are designed for that. And then if you are doing outdoor runs, make sure to get outdoor rated cables. They have a coating on them that keeps the sun from deteriorating this plastic edge. And they're also more shielded and things like that. But just make sure to buy the right fiber for your setup. It's not too hard to do though. And then after that, it's honestly pretty straightforward. I'm just gonna go ahead and run this throughout my house. It's a 30 meter cable, so it's not even coming close to what I could do, but it's actually really easy to use. And it's a lot smaller and lighter than the corresponding ethernet cable. So this right here is a Cat6 cable that's about 15 meters long. And you can see I didn't wind it nearly as tightly, but it takes up a ton more room than this cable in so many ways. The thickness of it is just a lot different and it's a lot heavier. And so some people have used them for very specific use cases where, okay, you've got to snake it through this really small area. Most people are not gonna have those requirements though. So it's probably not suitable for most people, at least watching this video. But yeah, I'm just gonna go ahead and set this up and I'm gonna go ahead and see if we can connect a Raspberry Pi, basically circling my entire house. 30 meters is a lot further than you think it is. So I'm gonna go ahead and plug this in on the other end and we'll come back. All right, so I just went through, plugged it in, and so now we've got this end right here. And I kinda wanna go over how to plug everything in, because fiber, it's not as straightforward as just your regular ethernet cable is, but it's really not that bad. So whenever you're dealing with fiber, you'll notice everything has a dust cover on it. There is a dust cover on the SFP slot. There is a dust cover on the LC connector. And at the end of the fibers, there's also little dust covers. Also, by the way, don't look into the fiber. It is a laser. So just make sure not to just stare into it. You don't wanna do that. It's very bright. So the first thing you wanna go ahead and do is always unplug the dust cover from the transceiver slot and just slot the transceiver in. It only goes in one way. And then once you've done that, you can pull off the dust cover for that. And so you'll notice there is a little latch right here. And so the latch allows you to lock this in place. So when the latch is up and it's latched, you can't pull the transceiver out, but when it's unlatched, you can pull the transceiver out. It unlocks. And so you wanna make sure that the latch is latched and locked before you put the, the fiber in because it's set up where as long as the fiber is plugged in, you're unable to unlatch it, which is what you want. So once you've got that set up, you just remove the little dust covers from the end of your fiber and save those in case you ever need them. And then it's pretty simple. You just go ahead and slot her in. You'll hear a click and that's it. And so now this is all set up. 
All right, and so now I'm just gonna go ahead and power the thing. And we're gonna go ahead and see if we can hook up a Raspberry Pi here. All right, so I've just got my Raspberry Pi right here. So if we look on the transceiver right here, you should see that the link light is on. And I've just got it set up way across the house. And so the link light is on, which means everything should be good. So I'm just gonna hook up this Raspberry Pi to it real quick. And we are going to see if we get a network signal. All right, and so just like that, you just plug it in like a regular ethernet and we are getting light. And so really that's all there is to it. This has now just become an insanely long ethernet cable. Technically the 30 meters I got is in spec, but if you need a longer run, you can just keep adding in length to this and buy a really, really long fiber optic cable and be able to run it really easily. All right, and so now let's just say we're, we're done with it and so we need to take it apart. And I'll just kind of walk through that real quick. So obviously unplug it. And then with fiber optic cables, you want to go through and first undo the latch on them to pull them out. There's a little connector, just like your locking ethernet cables are. Go through, put the dust covers back on. And those dust covers also serve to block the light so you don't accidentally shine a laser in your eye. And then that is done. Then for this, once you need to pull the transceiver out, you just unlatch it, pull it out, and just apply the dust cover back to everything and try not to drop it. And that's really all there is to it. Now you can do the exact same thing if you wanna build like a lightning protection circuit where you just have the two transceivers and a little fiber going in between them and that will give you that shielded lightning protection just like I was talking about. But other than that, it's actually pretty easy to go ahead and set this up. The other nice thing is once you've got this run in, you can pretty much go any speed you want in the future. So easily with a normal OEM4 fiber, you could then just upgrade it to 100 gig if you wanted to, depending on how long your run is. So it's nice that these fiber optic cables do also have a much easier upgrade path. You'll never really have to recable them unless you go really cheap at the beginning. So it's nice to have that though, probably outside of what most users would be doing. But the reason I'm actually running fiber in my house is so I can hit the 25 and maybe even the 100 gig standard at one point. All right, well that's gonna be it for this tutorial. Go and leave any other tutorials you'd like to see me make in the comments below and have a good one. Bye.